Hello everyone, we're back with The Artiste with Ivy Reese. I'm your host, Ivy Reese, and today our special guest is David Tucker. He is an international award-winning television writer, producer, and director. Several of his films have been nominated for Gemini Awards. His film, Amanda's Choice, uh, which is about early onset uh, Alzheimer's, won the Gemini Award for Best Direction in a Documentary Series. He's worked alongside David Suzuki on The Nature of Things as writer, producer, and director with nearly all the films that he's done with David Suzuki. Uh, his work has garnered him an invitation uh, to the Hot Docs numerous times as writer, producer, and director. His 2012 collection, uh, which is somewhere here, thank you, <laughs> One Way Ticket, collection of short stories, uh, is inspired by true events, uh, it's full of dark humor, and won the uh, Oakville Arts Council Literary Award in 2014. And uh, his upcoming, an up he's featured an upcoming anthology launching on Saturday, which is called Then and Now, and we'll tell you more about that and how you can talk to David at the end of the show. Today we're talking about aesthetics in media and fake news. Thank you for joining us. Hi, David. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. And um, so let's tell our viewers. So aesthetics. Um, you know, fake news is a big topic right now. And uh, aesthetics uh, is essentially how we perceive the world, sight, sound, touch. Uh, we'll have the slide on the screen right. here. Right. How would you describe it for your students? At well, uh, really, uh, much the way you have. It, it, uh, aesthetics is everything, really. It's how we experience the world through the senses. So that includes just about everything you could think of, including the full range of human experience and politics and fake news, whatever. It all has some kind of aesthetic core to it, how we express it, how we, you know, engage experience it. it, engage with it, experience it. Yes, exactly. Nice. Well, I mean, that's what is really important about it, because really, we are drawn to things that attract us. And media is all about attracting us. Mm -hmm. Politics is all about attracting us. Right. And uh, we're going to put another slide. There's going to be a few slides for this program. They're all made by David, I should say. And they're really interesting. Uh, he is a postgrad professor of film studies. And uh, this explains how aesthetics is, how is it political? Well, in this uh, particular in slide here, you can see um, at the very top, there's an airplane that's uh, Adolf Hitler uh, arriving for the uh, um, uh, big speech. And uh, it's from Triumph of the Will, a famous propaganda piece. By uh, Lenny Riefenstahl. <coughs> that's right. And uh, next you can see George Bush uh, arriving by uh, Air Force One and right uh, Putin in the middle, also in a helicopter, and of course Trump at the far end uh, with one of his planes. All of them, all four, are linked by the notion of this kind of Greek uh, notion of uh, Zeus coming out of the sky, coming down, and at the bottom you see shock and awe from the uh, Gulf War, uh, kind of, you know, raining down uh, thunderbolts. And um, this kind of iconography, uh, you know, is very uh, common in all of propaganda. You can find it with Mussolini or, you know, you name the dictator and you'll find this kind of imagery. And uh, so it's, it's just one example of how aesthetics uh, informs how we think about leaders, the notion of the strong man, how all of these people are depicted in that way. Absolutely. I mean, what I find striking is, you know, with aesthetics, we often think about art. And, but then again, media, marketing, advertising, politics even, clothing, anything needs that aesthetic appeal. And here, you know, we're relating back, like you said, to Zeus or, you know, Aristotle, and it, all these power stances with the uh, planes, you know, we don't often think about it when we see these images of leaders mm -hmm. coming to, you know, quick press conference. There's always, right. uh, often there is a plane behind them. Oh, yeah, sure. And, they're, they're uh, all and very carefully staged. And, it, and over the time, you can see how nothing really mm -hmm. changes in a way. No, it's, it's pretty universal. The, these kind of uh, tactics have been used for, uh, you know, 100 years. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. And we'll come back on the unchanging aspect, despite all of the change, at closer to the end of the program. And uh, so let me just see here. Yeah, the next slide. I mean, here, this goes a little bit more into the media narrative. Uh, 
again, how camera angles, lightings, and th they yeah. affect our choices. Yeah, well, we make these aesthetic choices and put together a narrative built on all of those elements, you know, whether we use sound, camera, lighting, locations we pick, uh, the stance of the characters, what the angle is, all of these things um, build toward a narrative and create that, that sequence. You know, we put these shots, one shot after another, and they form a narrative, just as the spoken word. Yeah, and exactly, and influence us in ways where this is obviously a, a still from a, a movie, but uh, mm -hmm. it's the same. Now, the next slide really leads us into uh, we're going to get it up on the screen for you. And it shows how aesthetics relate with, uh, well, how we see beauty and then also with celebrities. But with this one, again, and even uh, with Putin, Angela Merkel, I know, you know, it's the devil. You know, there's always these, you know, one image of her, right. you know, sure. the, the shadows and make it look like the devil is smiling. Right. And even here right. we can see how with Dexter or this is simple. Well, here you can see a, a, an evolution over time, um, you know, a sort of patriarchal narrative on the left and, uh, and a more feminist one on the right. And you can see the evolving um, <coughs> roles of women, the notion of the nurturer versus the strong woman that's in charge uh, as the uh, legal rep. And uh, over here we, we have, um, you know, the sort of patriarchal, um, sh you know, knight in, uh, knight Shine, in knight shining, shining armor, armor and the saint and, and then uh, of course uh, a much more destruct, you know, deconstructed uh, toxic male in a sense with uh, Dexter on the, on the right and that's, you know, again how we change our narratives over time. And, and it's interesting because so this, because our narratives are reflected everywhere so when our societal discourses affect our belief systems and aspirations and biases and that eventually gets That's right. reflected in the media mm -hmm. uh, and in the politics and to yeah. influence and us and how we vote. Yeah, and it, it's sort of a chicken or egg whether the media drives it or, or whether other factors drive it or, or it's a you know, like combination of factors all together that coincide and well, create a shift in how we see the world. Well, this next slide um, I find particularly interesting. Think it's uh, it shows how we create the mythology around celebrities, and it relates here to politics. I and mean, we have Trudeau, mm -hmm. images of him with uh, the Enchanted movie. I mean, the actor looks identical. <laughs> it's unreal. Yeah, and and, and uh, it was, I just uh, you know noticed that similarity one day and. Uh, went online and I found these images very quickly. I didn't spend a lot of time searching for them. They're, they're kind of, you know, iconic narratives and this is how we often see uh, celebrities. We create these mythologies around them. They're all, they're all part of a, a fairy tale. And we project ourselves onto them yeah. in the same way as we may project ourselves onto a leader. Yeah, sure. Well, you think of Camelot. I mean, that's the, the cliche with the Kennedys, of course. So, you know. so, I mean, if the digital aesthetic, and at the next slide will talk, get us more into this and relate how to politics. Now, this, I think, is one of the most striking slides. Um, but the digital aesthetic affects how we relate to the world. Sure. And even and alters how we communicate with each other, with ourselves, and our perceptions. Mm -hmm. And here, for example, we've got Hillary Clinton in 2006, and you see people reaching for they want to touch her hand. They're interacting with her mm -hmm. one on one. Mm -hmm. Whereas the 2016, yeah, it's, the it's, it's culture it's of selfies, striking yeah. the culture mm -hmm. of selfies, viewing the world through sure. a screen. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can even imagine if one of those people turned around to touch her, the, the security guards would attack immediately because right. it's, mm -hmm. it's become within a matter of five years since Oxford Dictionary made That's an right. official word. <clears throat> and, it, and it speaks to the, the larger um, connection or lack thereof uh, that we now have in society. Um, um, you know, if you travel on the GO train, if you traveled on the GO train 15 years ago, everyone was sitting there talking to each other. There was actually whole communities of people that would get on the train at the same time every morning and at the same spot and they'd all get to know each other and there was a lot of interaction. Now it's like a library. Everyone sits staring at their smartphone and if somebody 
so much as whispers. People look at them askance. Yeah, and, and fact, there's even the, a silent this, time. Uh, yeah, and there's a silent uh, second floor. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and this speaks to some of that too, the, the uh, disconnected way that we are connected to other people because the image that these people are creating this selfie will show Hillary Clinton in the background so that they're connected, but yet they're, their back is turned. So, I mean, it's almost symbolic of, mm -hmm. of that disconnect and that isolation that we now are experiencing through social media. Absolutely, and which leads to the, you know, I mean, we're in the, a lot of people are talking about this lately, starting to call it the age of anxiety. Mm. Uh, I was just hearing on CBC the other day uh, just how in the early 2000s, there was a very uh, progressive, optimistic view of how technology will better our lives, mm -hmm. connect us as, and the, connect everybody of all cultures. And now there's so much anxiety. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's just one thing I was reading recently. And uh, we'll go, or listening to rather, and thank you. The next slide here, I mean, this relates to how we're socially, uh, so socially isolated on the GO train. However, the private becomes public right. with selfies and the mm -hmm. public becomes private. Mm -hmm. And that's influenced pretty well uh, all levels of aesthetic. I mean, even drapes are out of fashion. You know, I mean, we used to always pull the drapes yes. at night and now we seem to, uh, I, I often come home at night and pass you know, windows that are wide open. I can see people making dinner or watching whatever they're watching on TV. I mean, it's quite an amazing shift in uh, how we have turned that around. And in a way, it's, it's almost like a desperate cry to, for recognition now that we have become so isolated. I have um, uh, students when Tinder first came out a few years ago, oh, the social I, yes. media app, um, I, um, they were so excited that, you know, oh wow, we got GPS, we can locate our dates, you know, they're all close by. And I'm saying, you know, this is a university, you just need to wait until the break and step out in the corridor and there's hundreds of people that are age appropriate, you can see what they look like, whether they're attractive to you or not. Uh, they have, uh, you know, the same educational level, same socioeconomics probably. Uh, you know, you've got, you can take every box area. and they're right there in front of you. Oh, I'd never do that. The students you know, here, they like look terror. horrified. Yeah, I know. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not belittling them. I, I, I understand just, the culture. that. so fear, fearful yeah, of it, it connecting one-on-one. On one. It is kind of sad in a way that we view the world now this way that we're not comfortable with direct contact. Yeah, and I actually I was listening to another thing on CBC just today. Uh, the gentleman who discovered Taylor Swift in 2004 and uh, Big Machine Record uh, label, and he she just moved on now, but he's discovered numerous other stars. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd left, I think it was uh, RCA Records, at any rate, a fabulous interview. And uh, he was asked, uh, one of the questions he was asked was, you know, because record labels are becoming a thing of the past, mm -hmm. and uh, and and he, the the person interviewing him on CBC uh, asked him, you know, what is it about rec? You know, what is it that you know? We always ask, what does the artist do that mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it makes a great artist? But what does the audience want? Right. And uh, and he was saying, he said the audience wants to feel connected. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. Taylor Swift, Beyonce. Mm -hmm. uh, all these big names still mm -hmm. sell out stadiums. Sure. So that is what an audience is looking for, is mm -hmm. how they need to connect. And that's mm -hmm. really one of the changing differences in, yeah. in some way. And, right. the, and, and that the digital platform still doesn't uh, fulfill that need, yeah. which is why people go to concerts. Mm -hmm. In a way, we, this has existed for a long time because, you know, commercial advertisers, products, you know, people selling products have distracted us from away from community anyway. You know, we've, we've thought that our role is to be a good consumer, you know, to go out and buy things is almost patriotic. And um, so we have been kind of set up for this behavior and now it's manifested itself uh, online through, uh, you know, this digital culture that we now have. So it's kind of, I sort of see it as a series of steps toward really almost complete isolation and perhaps uh, we'll be speaking to Siri more than we'll be 
talking to others. Yeah, yeah, and we're coming to that with AI in a few moments yeah, and more sure. on the fake news. And the next slide, thank you, is, uh, I mean, this is interesting, because when we talk about moder modern modernity and also, you know, even people, like modern houses will have the, mm. you know, they're more square shaped, they have the windows open. It's interesting, here it's, it's our brains, you were saying something to me the other day, but our brains do not like processing difficult things, and mm. we look at, um, so that's why it TV a, cell phones are more appealing. Yeah, it was a, a survival strategy, uh, you know, you recognize the familiar, and the familiar is less threatening than something unfamiliar, so if it's familiar, presumably it's a friend, or some uh, harmless animal, if it's unfamiliar, it's more likely a, a threat to you. So in that hunter-gatherer cycle that we lived in for the majority of our existence, um, you know, we became conditioned to that and, and so our perception of what's attractive too also stemmed out of that. You know, the, the less processing something takes, the um, easier it is to understand. It seems to be more attractive. And as we're exposed to new things that may seem jarring at first, as we get conditioned to them, then mm -hmm. they start to gradually become uh, more familiar, more familiar, more attractive over time. But um, do you, you know, think this is why we want AI to, or even GPS, where we we want to simplify and have computers think for us? Well, that's the danger, of course, isn't it? That you know, you eventually have everything done for you, and and uh, you're incapable once the system goes down to do anything. I mean, uh, if you think of the Internet of Things, um, you know, do I really need uh, a, a refrigerator to tell me my milk supply is running yeah. low? I mean, I think I could probably figure that out myself. But you know, we're building all this technology with the expectation we'll make some money out of this. Uh, by uh, creating all of these uh, incredibly complicated ways to do very simple things. Um, you know, the argument that all of this technology is, is convenience, um, I question that. Sometimes it's convenience and other times it's aggravation. You know, and your and modem does it, it actually takes away autonomy. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, takes away control. You grant permissions to all sorts of things on a phone. Right. E or you can't use the apps and you're holding a piece of plastic, uh, you know, yeah. plastic metal in your hand that's, that's good right. for picking up a Wi-Fi signal at best. Yeah. And, and the underlying reason for all this is that, you know, advertisers and so on are using the information that you're putting online. To cater the ads That's to you right. and influence exactly. you and everything. You shop, yeah. you can buy, purchase, even your election votes. So what started as this open source thing that you were talking about a few minutes ago has now become this big marketing uh, engine, uh, you know, that's controlled by a very small handful of players worldwide. Yeah, and I think the next slide actually, uh, which we're going to is perfect, yeah, because that leads us into how, you know, well, here we have CNN, we obviously have a caricature of Trump, and, uh, you know, fake news is propaganda by another name, you say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And sure. it's, it's nothing new, of course. No, it's been around for a very long time. It's just a, a different twist on it, but it's still disinformation, which has been around for a very long time. But then again, you said something to me that was uh, interesting the other day. Well, also, we're also... Um, well, recently, it's right here actually as well, the definition is broadened to include accurate news that people don't like. Mm -hmm. So if we don't like something, we can deem it, or well, I think that's what Trump right. does a lot, deem yeah. it fake sure. news. Right. If exactly. it goes against what you want to hear or see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like we're becoming more used to uh, having things catered for us. Yeah. Selections, articles we should read on Google well, Pocket, uh, things and, like that. And conversely, uh, giving up on uh, staying informed because we feel it's either a waste of time, it's fake, or, um, you know, it's just a, a one truth out of millions. So, you know, the facts seem to have uh, become far less important to a personal truth, I guess. You know, and, I mean, Trump's version of truth, that's his truth, you know, but facts may be something different. Absolutely, and there's always many truths, um, many, there's 
you know, even history in itself yeah, is a narrative right. that is man-made. Yeah. Because there's more than one truth to anything, and nothing in history is not linear. That's right. The victors always tell the, the truth. Yeah. 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 And now well, the next slide here talks about uh, AI, facial recognition. Essentially, we're being monitored 24-7 by spyware, GPS, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I was reading an article the other day that talked about uh, a new program that's in Japan where uh, you know, people actually die of overwork. Uh, they have a name for it, unfortunately escapes me right now. But uh, it's a facial recognition system, so when you clock into the office, you have to smile. Mm -hmm. And if you don't smile, and the, of course it measures your smiley, they call it smiley mm -hmm. recognition, and if it is below standard, you mm. are not allowed to clock in. Mm. Yeah, that's in China, and I believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. actually, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, China, mm -hmm. I was also reading on Japan mm -hmm. uh, in the same day. And uh, so there's that, but then also if you're clocking out and you're not smiling enough, you may not be allowed to clock out. Mm -hmm. And then people, I think it has split in Japan as well, but either way, people are also losing their jobs at McDonald's. And, and other places for not smiling enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, if you look at, uh, um, you know, corporate advertising or, you know, just type in something about, you know, you want a shot of, uh, generic shot of employees, you know, nine times out of ten, they're all sitting around a computer smiling broadly. You know, oh. it's part of corporate culture. and. Uh, often has very little to do with uh, uh, how one is really feeling. Uh, well, it, that was the thing. I mean, McDonald's used to mm -hmm. say on a corporate level, I mean, smile yeah. is free. Sure. I think the, they still say that. Yeah, and the, the Disney culture, of course. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, do you think that with... It sort of ties in with fakeness, I guess, doesn't it? Yeah, and I mean, but with all of this, I mean, the next slide shows, uh, and, I mean, China has launched uh, are their first English AI anchor. Right. Now, there's also uh, recently uh, a startup company in LA, uh, Brud, uh, revealed that uh, one of their social media influencers, who's known as Lil Michaela, uh, was actually an AI personality. Mm -hmm. And she's one of a few media influencers out there. And for those mm -hmm. of you who don't know, a uh, media influencer is someone who has over like a million Instagram followers. So you've got kids following these uh, AI personalities mm -hmm. uh, you, who are not real and they build their own narratives. Uh, here we've got an uh, anchor. Now if you've already, if a news anchor is uh, an AI person, then of course there's, the, the concept of non-biased news is completely out the window when it's a pre -pro mm -hmm. when it's a programmed machine with. Yeah, it's uh, deeply concerning uh, that, uh, um, Everything that we've taken for, you know, even even though words can be changed, uh, we always assume that uh, pictures and video and so on uh, is real, and um, now we can no longer make that assumption, and that will feed into the fake news narrative. Um, and Trump, in a way, has already done that with uh, um, his signing in ceremony, where he said he'd had the biggest crowd. Which he didn't. Which he didn't, but now... And he then he probably, said it was fake news yeah. when they had the overhead. And now, and now he could probably say, well, you know, they digitally took out all those people, you know, so, uh, I mean, that's, that's what we'll have next, probably. Oh, yeah, well, we're moving towards even, uh, I saw a thing recently that uh, in regards to, the, if, you know, if Obama was making a speech or something, you can literally, cha you know, yeah, use, sure. use his exact yeah. voice, change mm -hmm. his mouth, look like it's yeah. like he literally said certain words he did not say. Yeah, there are ways of, of determining whether something has been tampered with, but that that's becoming more and more seamless, so it's going to be harder and harder in the future. The technology always seems to be a bit head, ahead of the, those who are trying to determine whether it's uh, factual or not. So. We're in for a, a difficult time ahead, I think. So. Do you think with all this exposure to um, fakeness, you know, I mean, even little Michaela, talk about aesthetics. You know, she's, mm. you know, she's um, brands herself as, uh, you know, half Latino, I think. And, uh, you know, of course, she's, you know, beautiful looking and, you know, shops at all the right places, visits all, visits all the right places and is very trendy. And again, you can see how aesthetics there influences us. Um, do you think we're going to be able to less to as humans be able to discern the difference between real and fake? 
Well, I, I think there's going to be a, a, a difficult period of transition. Uh, eventually, I guess there'll be technology that will be able to instantly verify something, but right now there isn't. And uh, as this technology continues to push the envelope, uh, I think there'll be a lot of um, you know, fake news coming out that will seem even harder to um, verify and will cause even greater disruption and will play into all kinds of foreign actors and other people that want to disrupt governments and uh, um, influence people to buy things or accept and that relates to capitalism, essentially, sure. which mm -hmm. is a finite. We are. We have a finite planet. You were mm -hmm. saying, and well, and, I mean, and our whole system is based on growth, isn't it? And we have a finite planet. So if you keep growing and your company gets bigger and there's more and more people, we've gone from, you know, doubled or more than doubled our population size since about 1990, which really isn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at some point. We'll all be standing side by side each other. You know, there won't be any room left. And how are we going to continue to grow and use resources? So, you know, it's really a, 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 a system that worked very well for a long time, but it's reached its limit. I think much the way communism died out and it had had its day, uh, I, I, I fear that, you know, capitalism may have, have reached its limit too at some point. We, we seem to be absolutely blind to the impact that it's having on the planet. Uh, we are conditioned as human beings to think in terms of short-term crises. You know, where's the food on the table today? Or is it bad weather? Well, I'll stay in today, but tomorrow will be okay. Uh, rather than thinking long-term, you know, what's happening, you know, sort of the weather versus climate, you know, fallacy. And uh, so it is very concerning. It uh, is. We, we have to do something, uh, um, you know, and, and frankly, so much of what we're talking about is really shouldn't be that significant. You know, it's all appearance and, and, Appearances, and, aesthetics. and time wasters and, you know, diversion, distraction from these bigger issues. And Trump is a master of diversion anyway. Well, I think most countries are pretty good at uh, diverting our attention. I mean, right now the big diversion almost worldwide is immigrants. Uh, you know, they're the they're the, the current enemy, you know. And, and populism is growing on a yeah. on a global scale, really. Yeah. Uh, in more and more countries, Poland, Hungary, uh, the states, of course, yeah. uh, and at Turkey. The same, yeah, and at the same time we've got terrible climate problems, drought, and civil war in so many countries. I mean, these people are uh, desperate. And, um, you know, we have have so much, you know, regardless of whether we're selfish about it. Uh, you know, I, uh, at some point we have to uh, either accept that there's going to be a mass die-out mm. of our own population, or we'll have to do something to... Um, have a civil uprising? Yeah, well... I don't think, you know, that what we need are reforms. We don't need a civil uprising. I mean, civil uprisings always end in violence and people get killed. You right. know, you don't want that. But I do think we need some significant reforms that people just aren't willing to, to make. And, uh, you know, it's for a whole variety of reasons, vested interests and others, that, and misinformation and so on. And it's we, becoming harder to tell the difference between real and fake information. Yeah. And, and we are so focused on, you know, being taxpayers, we're called taxpayers, you know, and so we, you know, what's a taxpayer supposed to do? Well, pay less taxes, that's my goal, I'm a taxpayer, right? And everyone thinks that way. Um, but, you know, if we were called citizens, yes. then we would engage, you know, that we would have some responsibility to the rest of the people around us. and. Um, you know, it's great to have tax cuts, but eventually there's there's no resources left for, you know, to pay for anything, medicine or whatever. I mean, that's that's the end game with a purely libertarian mindset. 
Yeah. Well, you have uh, a lot to say on this topic and others uh, in regard to how politics affect us, capitalism. And uh, we have to wrap up right now. Sure. But thank you so much for joining us, David. You're very um, welcome. Everyone, I'd like to tell you again, David Tucker is a postgrad pr professor of film and film studies at Ryerson. He's a Gemini award-winning director, worked with David Suzuki. Uh, he is available for lectures, uh, talks, anything. Uh, we're going to post his contact info on the screen. And again, his award-winning book, One Way Ticket, collection of short stories full of dark humor inspired by true events. Uh, won an award uh, in 2014 with the Oakville Arts Council. Uh, you can order his book online. The information should be there for you. It's by Bookland Press. You can also order it from Brook Bookland Press or email David and uh, he will be happy to arrange getting a signed copy to you. Reach out to David at uh, dtucker at ryerson.ca and you can visit his website, which is davidtucker.ca, um, just to find out a bit more. I know you're saying you're going to be refreshing it, in the, but it's got info. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for coming on and uh, talking to us about My how aesthetic, it leaves, it leaves us with a lot to think about. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you, David. All right.